Jesus never said that. And so I, I, as we over the last few weeks, if we've been going through this series and we've been looking at things like God helps those that help themselves and God just wants you to be happy and it, it doesn't matter what you believe as long as you believe something. And so I don't know about you guys, but I have thoroughly enjoyed this series. I think it's been a good series. I think it's been awesome to be able to take a look at some of the things that we believe as culture that Jesus said or that is in the Bible when we find out that those things never were really said at all. But let me ask you a, a question this morning. When was the last time that you were stressed out? Like, when was it, right? Like, when was the last time that you were stressed out? I, I, I mean, like, pull your hair out, stressed out. I mean, we've all been there, right? Haven't we? I mean, sometimes it's negative stuff that, get, that gets us there. Our kids are acting up. Maybe it's aging parents or medical concerns or a loss of a family member or loss of a marriage or loss of a friendship Work stress, financial stress, depression, anxiety, headaches, lack of sleep, fear, loneliness, all these negative things that can sometimes put us on the verge of this, em- this enormous amount of stress that comes on us. But sometimes it's, it's good stuff that stresses us out. A new baby, a growing family, a promotion at work new territory, new relationship, you joined a a group at church, opportunities that are coming your way, a new house, a pay raise, a new season of your favorite show on Netflix that you haven't binged yet. Like there's always some good stuff that seems to be happening sometimes in our life and it can cause us even good stuff, can cause us stress. But it's usually in one of these stressful seasons. It's usually in one of these stressful seasons that some good-hearted, well-meaning person says the phrase that we're going to talk about this weekend. They walk up to us in the midst of whatever's happening, or they text us, and they just say, don't worry, God will never give you more than you can handle. Don't worry, God will never give you more than you can handle. Show of hands this morning, in that moment, don't you just want to love on them with a throat punch? (laughs) I mean, in Jesus' name, of course, right? In Jesus' name, of course. But here's the idea, that God will never give you, when someone tells us that, that God will never give you more than you can handle. Their heart is in the right place, but their theology is off. Their heart is in the right place, but their theology is a little off. And so this morning, I I want us to dig into this statement that Jesus never said. And so the idea, the idea comes from an often misquoted verse. And, and, And let me set this up for today. There's a lot of scripture today. And so there's a lot of different verses that I'm going to reference. I'm going to read them. They'll be on the screens behind me. Uh, but I know a lot of times we just camp out on a couple verses today. I'm going to give us a lot of context for, for this particular statement. Because of the four statements that we've looked at over the last four weeks, this is the one that I've heard the most out of all of these. And so I'm going to give us a lot of context today. But this idea that God will never give you more than you can handle comes from this misquoted verse in 1 Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 10, verse 13. And so it says this, it says, no temptation is overtaking you. This is not common to man. God is faithful and he will not let you be tempted beyond your ability. But with the temptation, he will also provide the way of escape that you may be able to endure it. So in this verse, Paul is writing and he's talking to the, the church in Corinth, and he's saying, hey, listen, when it comes to temptation, I mean, God is faithful, and he's not going to let you be tempted beyond your ability, and he will always provide a way of escape, that he will never tempt you beyond what you can endure. And so we take this verse, and we twist it, and we move it, and we twist it around a little bit for it to fit this, but Paul is not talking about pressure or stress. Paul is talking about temptation. It's totally different things. And so we, we take this verse and we, we kind of manipulate it, we kind of twist it around a little bit for it to go, well, the Bible says that God will never give me more than I can endure. 
But it's not talking about pressure and stress. It's, it's talking about temptation. And, and the truth is, is that throughout, throughout the Bible, we see illustration after illustration where God actually let people have more than they can handle. Gideon felt absolutely inadequate. Moses felt absolutely overwhelmed by the needs of God's people. Esther, who we're going to hear about in a few weeks in our next series, felt pushed beyond her limit and standing up to the king. David, King David, the David that took down Goliath, after he sinned, he, he felt completely ashamed and guilty. Look with me now, if you can just kind of follow on the screens today or take notes and you can look at these scriptures later. But in Psalm chapter 38, verses 4 through 8, David, that we just referenced, after he had sinned, after he had fallen, after he had had something happen in his life, he writes this. And it says, For my iniquities I have, have gone over my head. Like a heavy burden, they are too heavy for me. My wounds stink and fester because of my foolishness. I am utterly bowed down and prostrate all the day I go about mourning. For my sides are filled with burning and there is no soundness in my flesh. I am feeble and crushed. I groan because of the torment of my heart. Does that sound like God will never give you more than you can handle? I mean, David has sinned, and he has messed up, and he is writing this, and obviously it sounds like he has a lot more on his plate than he knows how to handle. He's writing this and going, man, my iniquities, my, my sins, the things that are going on inside my head, head and inside my heart, they are like a heavy burden that is too heavy for me. My wounds stink and fester because of my foolishness. I am actually utterly bowed down. I, I am prostrate meaning he is literally laid out on the floor, face in the carpet, so to speak, laid out, just distraught by what is gone on and what is going on in his life. That I am feeble and I am crushed. I groan because of the torment of my heart. It sounds like David has more than he can handle. That even Jesus was overwhelmed. If you're familiar with the story, before Jesus was arrested and would later lead to, would be later crucified, that Jesus is in the garden in Mark chapter 14, verses 33 through 34. And this is Jesus talking. And it says, and he took with him Peter and James and John and began to be greatly distressed and troubled. And he said to them, My soul is very sorrowful, sorrowful, even to death. Remain here and watch. That Jesus knows what is about to come his way. Jesus knows what is about to happen. Jesus knows that he's about to be arrested. He knows that he's about to be led to one of the most painful, excruciating deaths that you could possibly have. And in this moment, he says to them, man, my soul is sorrowful, even to death. I mean, Wow. I mean, think of that, that even in that moment, Jesus was overwhelmed to the point of death. And so if God does give us more than we can handle sometimes, if God does give us more than we can bear sometimes, if God gives us more than we can take on our shoulders and carry around, if God gives us more than we can handle, the, the next logical question is why? And so why does God sometimes give us more than we can handle. This morning, I, I want to give you four reasons. The first one is this, to bring us to the end of ourselves. The first reason why God gives us more than we can handle is to bring us to the end of ourselves. God is not in the self-reliance game, but that's our mindset. It's what we talked about just the other week, that God helps those that helps themselves. Man, if I, get, I just got to pull myself up on my bootstraps, and I've just got to get this thing done, and I've just got to do whatever it takes, and life's going to punch me in the face, and life's going to throw punches at me, and lunch is good, lunch, life is going to do this, and life is going to do that. But man, you know what? I'm just going to keep moving on, because I just got, if, if it's up to, if it's meant to be, it's up to me. I'm going to get things done. I, I, I got this. 
to see if we can do it on our own, then we don't need God. And one of the most dangerous and scary places to be is in a place where you don't think that you need God. You ever find yourself in a position where you think you got it? It could be something as simple as an interview. It could be something as much as your life is falling apart and you can fill in the blank, whatever that may be. But one of the scariest places and most dangerous places that you can possibly be is in a place where you don't think that you need God. It's pride. Proverbs 16, 18 tells us that pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. People that feel like they don't need God in their life. Christians who feel like in this moment, you know what, I just got this. God, you failed me here, or this should have never happened, and I don't understand why God's letting this happen, and whatever it is, and you know what, I, God, I got it this time. I prayed and prayed and prayed, and I gave you an opportunity, and you didn't show up, and you didn't do what you needed to do, and so in the moment, you know what, God, I got this. Pride comes, goes before destruction. Pride does three things to us. It blinds us to reality. It pushes God out. It makes us believe that we're better and stronger than we really are. I mean, think about that. We all know people that are prideful. You may be in this room this morning and you have a sense of pride about you. But pride blinds us to reality. We think we're better and stronger than we really are. Like, it doesn't matter. Right? Big S on our chest. Like, I got this. And it blinds us to reality. And then when we think that we can handle it on our own, and when we think, man, I, I've just got to get it done. If it's, if it's meant to be, it's up to me. Then we just push God to the side, like, thanks, big man, I got this one. But then it makes us believe that we're better and stronger than we are. I mean, pride, that's why as Solomon is writing the book of Proverbs, he tells us this, that pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before the fall. I mean, there have been so many times in my life where I've come to the end of myself. And it was there that I found out that how truly faithful God really is. That God allowed in my life more than I could handle to bring me to the end of myself. That I find myself like David in Psalm 34, where I am prostrate on the floor, face in the carpet, going, God, I don't know what else to do unless you show up. And God is finally like, good. Now I can take over. Now I can take control. Now that you're done trying to figure it all out, knucklehead, I got it. The second thing, or the second reason why God gives us more than we can handle, is to reveal something about our heart to us. To reveal something about our heart to us. Because see, here's the interesting thing about us. And I say us as the people that are in this room and just culture and society in general. In general, That when everything is going good, we don't really learn much about the true state of our heart, do we? Like when everything is going well in your life, when everything is moving in one direction and everything seems to be going good, you don't really understand what's going on in your heart and in your mind. Like you're just like, man, I got this. Things are good. Woo, God is awesome. Everything is going good. Like you don't realize all the junk and all the stuff that you've just kind of pressed down behind whatever may be going well in that moment for you. And so when things are really going good for us, we don't really learn much about the true state and the condition of our heart. But let the wheels come off. Let the debt pile up. Let the pink slip at work come. Let the spouse walk out. And suddenly we are very, very aware of what's going on in our heart. Let a friend stab us in the back. Let a medical condition flare up. Let a relative make a comment at the family barbecue. Yay, family barbecues. And suddenly the true condition of our heart gets revealed, right? Doesn't it? Like everything seems to be going good in your life and then one person makes one comment and you flip out. And you just go off on a tangent or you're frustrated or you're upset or this friend stabs you in the back and doesn't do what they say they're going to do and leaves you hanging. And then all of a sudden you find out in that moment exactly what's going on in your heart. You actually understand or not maybe don't understand but you see and hear and feel what is going on in your heart at that moment. In Psalm. 139.23, 
David writes, search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts. I mean, David is writing this in this moment. He's like, you know what? Like, God, just search me. Like, when's the last time you asked God to just search what's going on in your heart? Maybe you're feeling a little anger. Maybe you're feeling a little bitter. Maybe you're feeling a little jealousy. Maybe you're feeling whatever you fill in the blank. Because I could give you a thousand different adjectives and descriptions. But, man, God, you know what? Search me, O oh God, and know my heart and try me and know my thoughts. Sometimes God gives us more than we can handle to separate the good and the bad in our life. If any of you guys are, are, are cooks in this place this morning, one of the reasons, one of the many reasons why I love my wife is she can cook like nobody's business. And I like to eat, so it's a good combination, right? But Kim makes this beef stew that she makes in the crock pot, and you guys know, we use this illustration a lot, like things cooked in the crock pot are a lot better than if I cooked it in the microwave, right? I could open a can of Dinty more and put it in the microwave for a couple minutes, or I could eat beef stew that's been sitting in a crock pot for eight hours, and I promise you the crock pot beef stew is better. And you eat the beef stew, and I'm not a big leftover guy. I've learned to eat leftovers because I'm a church planner, but I'm not a big leftover guy, but beef stew is one of those things where I actually kind of like leftovers. And if you ever had beef stew and you put it in the fridge and it sits in the cold fridge all night and you go to take it out of the Tupperware and you take the lid off and like all the junk has risen to the top and the fat has risen to the top and it's kind of this nasty, gross, congelled thing on the top of it. You know what I'm talking about? And you either like, all right, you're messing my illustration up, Amanda. And so you either have to either take the spoon and, like, bust it up, and then once you put it in the microwave for a couple minutes and it heats up, it's gone. Or if you're like me, you just kind of scrape it off the top. If you're Amanda, you just eat it with a spoon. <laughs> but either way, right? But either way. But the, all the junk has kind of risen to the top. And, like, what do you do with it? And, and the good and the bad have kind of separated in it. Or have you ever just thrown some chicken on the stove and you boil it and you just like it down and all the junk kind of rises to the top. And so often in our life, there, God gives us more than we can handle so that the good and the bad in our life will separate. And in this season, when we find ourselves and we're looking at our hearts and we're asking God, search me, oh God. Know my heart, know my anxious thought, knows what is going on inside of me. When we find ourselves in this season, instead of cursing God, we should stop and ask God to search our hearts. I mean, I could use any of us as an example this morning. But I, I use myself in the idea that, man, I just know that there's so often that I just have to take a step back and go, God, why do I feel this way? Like, what's going on inside my heart? Like, what should I do? How do I handle this? What should I? Search me, Lord. Like, show me what I should do in this moment. Help me understand why I feel the way that I feel. Show me. Search my heart. Show me. Understand my thoughts, Lord. Help me here. So often in these seasons when things go negative and things go bad and everything seems to fall apart and the will seems to come off the bus, and the good and the bad in our life is kind of separated. We just kind of embrace the bad and, and just move on. We just pull ourselves up by the bootstraps. But maybe God is allowing the season in your life. Maybe God is giving you more than you can handle so that the good and the bad can separate in your life. The third reason why I believe God gives us more than we can handle is to get us to depend on him. When I was young and my ministry career and I was just getting started and getting plugged into youth ministry and I had heard this a lot and I, I would even admit to you that I'm guilty of even saying it to some people. And then one day a pastor that I followed from a distance that's in a, a, a large church in another state, well he's not there anymore, and I listened to him preach a, a message one time and you know, often I listen to podcasts or watch other videos of pastors. It's kind of like how I get fed. You guys are here on Sundays listening to me preach, but I listen to other guys preach because it fills my tank. And I'm listening to him preach, and he's talking about as a 12-year-old boy 
how he, the, his mom had died from cancer. And that all these people had come to him and said, don't worry, don't worry, God never gives you more than you can handle. God never gives you more than you can handle. And in the midst of his sermon, he was like, no, God does give us more than we can handle so that we'll be dependent upon him. And the moment that I said it, like, I felt guilty because I knew there was people that I had said this to. There was things that even as a young youth pastor, like, I, was, I wasn't even quoting scripture, but I thought that I was. And it changed my whole mindset. And so one of the reasons why God gives us more than we can handle is for us to, to get us to depend on Him. I mean, as I said a few moments ago, I mean, as human beings, we are independent, aren't we? Some of you more than others. But ever since the Garden of Eden, we've been wanting to depend less on God and more on ourselves. So often, we want to, we want to rely on our own strength and our own power and our own gifts and ourselves. Like, man, I just... I got this. But when trouble and hardship and things come our way, then it recenters us on our, our dependency on God. At least it should. When God gives us more than we can handle, it should recenter our dependency on Him. Not on the world, not on alcohol, not on drugs, not on pornography, not on TV. Not on their spouse, not on our kids, not on work, not on our hobbies, not on whatever we do to take our mind off of stuff. It shouldn't recenter us on that. It should recenter us on the Father. Psalm 46.1, David writes again, And God is our refuge and our strength, a very present help in trouble. That all our struggles and all our opportunities are for us to increase our dependence on God. Always, always, always. That our troubles and our struggles are opportunities for us to increase our dependency on God. Always, always, always. When we don't understand why something is happening, we can still trust. When we don't understand why this happened to us financially, we can still trust. When a friend stabs us in the back, we can still trust. When this happens or that happens or whatever comes your way or you get bad news at the doctor's office or you get bad news at work or whatever happens, we can still trust. And I know, even in a church our size, that there are people that are sitting out in these seats this morning that are struggling with something right now. And your struggle may be different than the person to your left or to your right or to the front of you or to the back of you. But there are people that are sitting in these seats right now that are struggling with something. And in this moment, whatever that struggle is and whatever that worry is and whatever is weighing upon you this morning, it should increase our dependency on the Father. Turn to the Father. Don't turn to anything else. The fourth thing, or the fourth reason why God gives us more than we can handle, is to prove that His grace is sufficient for us, no matter what. To prove that His grace is sufficient for us, no matter what. Seems like we're talking a lot about David and Paul this morning, but Paul gives us such a great example of this. That in 2 Corinthians chapter 11 and chapter 12, Paul begins to unpack his ministry. You can go back and you can read it yourself later and you can begin to kind of see what's happening. But Paul just begins to talk about all the things that have happened to him since he went from a person who was arresting and persecuting and killing Christians to really the top church planner, missionary, on fire for Jesus guy. Like Paul had this radical transformation in his life on an experience on the road to Damascus with Jesus. And we've talked about it often here. And Paul sets out on a mission to, to change the world for Jesus Christ. And there's nothing that's going to stand in his way. And nothing that is going to deter him from what he wants to do. He is beaten. He is flogged. If you don't know what that is, it's like a, a leather band with a bunch of glass or metal and different things. It's the same thing that they whip Jesus with. He's flogged and he's beaten and he's arrested. He's thrown in jail. He's shipwrecked. 
All this stuff happens to Paul. And in chapters, in 2 Corinthians chapter 11 and 12, he just begins to kind of unpack some of the things that have happened in his life. Like you think you've had a bad life. Read Paul's story. But in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 9, he says this. He says, my grace, and this is God talking to him, that my grace is sufficient for you. My power is made perfect in weakness. He says, but you said to me, my grace is sufficient for you. For my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly of my weakness so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. But Paul's like, man, all this stuff has happened in my life. All this turmoil and all this trouble and all these beatings and all this stuff that's happened to me, all because I'm pursuing Jesus, where most of us, that would have happened to us once, if then, and we would walk away from our faith. We wouldn't endure the things that Paul endured. And Paul is like, you know what? But he said to me, Christ said to me, that my grace is sufficient for you. For my power is made perfect in what? In weakness. Your weakness. See, our, our struggles are a time for us to push into God, not pull away. But for some reason, and, and I'm guilty of it myself, for some reason, we feel like in the midst of trouble and in the, in the midst of struggle that we should, we just, we got this. Like we're so self-reliant on ourselves that, you know what, and we just, we get in the midst of trying to fix the things and we get in the midst of trying to take care of stuff and we get in the midst of just trying to fix things. If you're a fixer, I'm a fixer, I just want to fix things all the time. Like just give me small details and let me fix it, let's move on. Like we just feel like we can do it on ourselves, we can do it in our power, but Paul says no. And Jesus says, my grace is sufficient for you, my, for my power is made perfect in weakness. When is the last time that you just admitted to the Father that you were weak and you needed him? When was the last time you're like, God, you know what? If you don't show up, this isn't going to happen. If you don't show up, I'm not going to be able to do this. Like, Father, I am weak in this moment. I am on the floor, on my knees, can't stand up. Like, if you don't show up, I can't move forward. His power is made strong in our weakness. But we feel like so often, man, that we can, we got this, and we just pull away. We just step away. But instead of pulling away, what if we were to push in? What if we were to lean in? What if you're like, you know what, God, I want to take control. And I want to fix this. And I want to do whatever I got to do. And I, I feel like I can do these things. But you know what, Father? I'm going to slow down long enough to just lean in just a little bit. Let you whisper in my ear. And tell me what I should do. And tell me that you love me. And tell me that you got me. And tell me that you'll always be there. And tell me that you'll never leave me or nor forsake me. Father, instead of me pushing away, Lord, let me, let me push into you. When we find ourselves at the end of ourselves, what we find out is that God is always enough. He never promised us an easy life. He never promised us even a self-sufficient life. But He did promise us that He would never leave us nor forsake us. And He did promise that His grace would be sufficient. And grace is, if you don't understand, I mean, grace is getting something that you don't deserve. Like, or grace is or, or getting something that you don't deserve. Like, we don't deserve his grace, but he loves us enough that he gives us his grace. We don't deserve it. We don't, we don't deserve his love. We're sinful. We're messed up. All of us. Some of us more than others. But we all got sin in our life. And we all got struggles in our life. And we all got times that we turn our back on him. And we all got times in the week where we just get so busy we forget about him. We haven't prayed or read our Bible or even said, God, you know what? I love you today. But there's all these times. We don't deserve his grace, but yet he gives us grace anyways because he loved us. And he loved us enough that he sent his son to die on a cross for you and for me. And God is enough. And so, yes, 
God does give us more than we can handle. He gives us more than we can handle all the time to bring us to the end of ourselves, to reveal something about our heart to us, to get us to depend on Him, and to prove to us that His grace is sufficient for us no matter what. God is enough. God is enough. And if you don't remember anything else that I say this morning, remember this. That God is enough, and He is faithful, and He is present. Know that He is here. For those of you that are struggling this morning, for those of you that have got something that is just eating at you this morning, for something that is weighing heavy on you this morning, know that He's present. Know that He already knows. He already knows. Whether you've told Him, whether you've opened your heart to Him, whether you've expressed it to Him or not, He already knows. He's faithful. He's present. He's enough. The further that I go, and the longer that I walk with Jesus, I find out two things to be true. That life is harder than I ever imagined it would be. That life is harder than I ever imagined it would be. But I've also learned that God is more faithful and present than I ever imagined he could be. So I've learned that life is harder than I ever imagined it would be, but I've also learned that God is more faithful and present than I ever imagined that he would be. And so I challenge you guys this morning. I mean, we've walked through four statements, four statements that cover a lot of different things in our lives. For those of us that are super independent and feel like we got it all together, we don't really need any help. We can just do it on our own. That God helps those that helps themselves. For those of you that just be able, God just wants me to be happy so I can live my life and do whatever I want and just ask for forgiveness at the end of the day. And as long as I'm happy, then God's good. God doesn't want your happiness. He wants your obedience. Or it doesn't really matter what you believe. As long as you believe something. No, we got to believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God and that he stepped down out of heaven to give his life for you and for me and that he loves you enough because of that. And we got to know and we got to understand that God is going to give us more than we can handle all of our lives, all of our testimonies, whether we're a teenager in the room or whether we're an adult in the room, Wherever we fall in the age bracket thing today, we all have walked through seasons in this life where we felt like, man, I cannot move forward. I got way too much on me. But I thought they said that God would never give me more than I could handle. Jesus never said that. But he does. He does give us more than we can handle. So that we're not relying on ourselves. So that we can understand what's going on in our heart. We can turn that over to Him. So that we can fully, 100% be dependent upon Him. Are you? Are you 100% dependent on the Father? Or is it just sometimes? Or when it feels good? Or on Sunday mornings? But are, are, are you 100% dependent upon the Father? And do you know and do you understand that His grace is sufficient for you in your weakness? He doesn't say in your strength. He says in your weakness. My grace is sufficient for you. I will have power in your weakness. So the challenge on the table for you today is this. Is are you walking through something right now? That is way too much for you to handle. And if you are, good. And I don't mean it to be insensitive, and I don't mean it in a way to, to make it sound demeaning, like why would my pastor want me to have struggles in this life? But I do mean it this way. That if you're going through something right now in life that is too much for you to handle, I'm glad. And I'm hoping that after today that you would find yourself in a position where you would go, God, you know what? I can't do this anymore. I can't, I've done it myself. I've tried so much. And God tells you the same thing he told me. Good. Now I can take over. Now I can have control. 
Thank you for trying, but now sit down and let me control your life. If you're going through something right now in your life, God wants to pr prove his sufficiency for you right now. I mean, God wants to tell you and show you that he is enough for you. Do you know that? And better yet, do you know that and do you believe that this morning? That you know without question that God is sufficient enough for you. That he's all you need. You don't need anything else but him. He will take care of everything for you. In his own time and in his own way. It may not be the way that you want it to be, but God will take care of it in his time and his way. And he will get the glory for it. But he wants to prove to you this morning that he is sufficient for you right now. Lean in. Push in. I mean, focus on the Father. Focus on what he's doing. Let him carry the burden for you. Jesus famously said, man, like, this yoke is too heavy. Like, let me carry it. Let me carry the yoke. Let me carry the burden for you. Let, 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 let me do this for you. So often, man, we just throw it up on our shoulders and we got this. And we walk and we carry it and little by little we just get weaker and weaker and weaker and just weighs us down and weighs us down and weighs us down to the point that maybe you find yourself on your knees or you find yourself prostrate because you can't stand back up. And in that moment and in that weakness, man, God wants to show up and show you that he's sufficient for you. And God is enough. And God is faithful. And God is present. And so this morning, I, I want to ask you guys to close your eyes and bow your heads for me for just a moment.